And here is the sequel to Baroque, Rococo. Rococo is the art of the 18th century, the art of the Enlightenment, um, and, and is the art that really grows out of and in reaction to and, and against some of the uh, uh, rules and tendencies and, and oppressiveness uh, that we saw in, uh, in, in Baroque. Um, so, so, you know, what is, what is, what is Rococo? Well, it, it, it most, it, it, it rises during the 1700s in France, during the reign of Louis the 15th. Uh, this is the grandson of the Sun King, Louis the 14th, um, the, the father of the unfortunate Louis the 16th, who will fall during the, the French Revolution. And, and Louis the 15th is, um, Oh, he's a somewhat limited guy, um, but but he's not as oppressive or as forceful or as imposing a figure as Louis the Fourteenth, and the art reflects that. The, the the Rococo is this sort of reaction of the nobility against the classical Baroque imposed at Versailles. Just, you know, just as Louis XIV imposed his will upon the French nobility, as he imposed upon them to come to Versailles and wait upon him, so he imposed the Baroque art styles. When Louis uh, XIV dies, uh, you know, after the, the later years of his life were particularly somber and oppressive, and as, as he approached death, Louis XIV became somewhat grim, um, uh, he, um, so, so when he dies, people are ready for him to go. And Louis XV is seen as a kind of a breath of fresh air and the art, the, the relaxed rules um, of Rococo are part of the nobility's, French nobility's pushing back against Louis, against the absolutism of the Sun King and trying to reestablish their own prerogatives. So, so what what is Rococo? What's the word mean? Um, well, it comes from Rokil, um, uh, which Rokil, which means stones, uh, Coquille, which is shells. Um, so you, you know, think about these irregular shapes in nature, right? Um, uh, nature is not full of uh, strictly ordained curves and lines. Uh, it, it, nature is irregular, um, and and Rococo was trying to mimic that irregularity um, in in nature. Um, it, the the style of Rococo is is in, is based on the sort of uh, bright colors um, that we saw in Rubens. Um, uh, and, and this sense that nature is more important than the classical world. You remember that the classical world was part of the forced allegory that Baroque used to support power. We're getting away from that. It's too heavy. It's too serious. We, we, we want nature. Nature is nicer. Um, it, it, it's, it's a better thing to focus on than all of this heavy Greek stuff. Um, and, as, and, and, and there's this sort of evolution from the Baroque, away from the earnest, away from the serious. Why, you know, think, <laughs> why so serious? Come on, let's, let's just have fun. Let's, let's enjoy the things which are superficial and shallow. There's joy there, too. Um, as a decorative style, it's, it's very concerned with detail, uh, with, with complex compositions. They loved mirrors and the, the suggestion of reflection and superficial appearance. Brush strokes are very wispy, you know, the stark drama of, of Baroque, you know, with the bright brights and the dark darks and the shadows. No, 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 no. We want light pastels and hues, much nicer, much, much gentler art. And, and there's this there's this sense that, that Rococo is supposed to be feminine, right? I, 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 I don't think it's entirely fair to just genderize the art, but in the crudest sense, Baroque you think of as masculine imposition and Rococo as a much more intimate, feminine kind of grace and charm with 
delicate superficiality and a kind of sweetness. Is this all that femininity is? No, of course not. But that was the sort of stereotype and that's what the art appealed to. Um, the main subject matter of Rococo was this sort of idealized life of the aristocracy. How wonderful it is to be rich and of good family and good breeding and to have nice manners and good clothes and to be able to hang around in this elegant lifestyle, to, to live a life of leisure without worry. It's not about function. It's not about job. It's not about accomplishment. It's, it's much more sensual. It's, it's, about, it's about love and, and sexual intrigue and flirting and dating and all this, this kind of stuff. That's the essence of, of Rococo. And, and that's what we're going to look at when we, when we see these paintings. Okay, so we begin uh, in France. Rococo is uh, a style that grows first and foremost out of France and the French sensibilities uh, of the 18th century. Um, one of the most prominent of the Rococo artists is Jean-Antoine Watteau, uh, who, who was born in the late 17th century and does most of his work in the, in the early 18th century. Um, you know, he, he's about this revival of interest in color and, and movement. He, he looks at those paintings of Rubens. Remember the, those, those Rubenesque uh, figures we saw um, uh, with Marie de Medici and all that, and, 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 um, and, and sort of revitalizes it with this less severe naturalistic Rococo style. Um, and, and, and so, um, uh, here, let, let me look, look at some of his stuff. This, this is called the love song. And, and, you know, I mean, it's very different from Baroque, right? You can tell right away that the, the, the colors are more subtle, gentler, pastels, and the subject matter is, is, is frivolity, right? I mean, here are, here's this, this guy, this player with a guitar who's trying to charm this young woman, and she seems to be receptive, uh, shall we say, uh, and they're surrounded by nature, right? Not, not the formal settings of palaces and man imposing will, on, but no, no, gentle nature and its greenery and its loveliness. Um, obviously, no suggestion at all these two people have jobs, they have anything they're supposed to do. No, they're, they're just, they're, they're hanging out and they're enjoying each other and they're flirting with each other. Um, this is, is perhaps uh, Watteau's most, most famous painting, the embarkation for Sithira. Sithira is a, uh, was, was in Greek mythology the island of Aphrodite, the island of the goddess of love. Um, and, and, and what we have here is sort of this, this party, you know, this, this amorous celebration that, you know, with the, the, here's the French aristocracy uh, celebrating um, this, this period of pleasure and peace after the somber period uh, at the end of Louis XIV's reign. You know, and so, so what we're seeing here is a celebration of love. We've got little, like cupids flying around, um, uh, you know, uh, pushing these couples closer together. There's the statue of Venus there. Um, you know, you've got, you got three pairs uh, of lovers here. Um, and, and, you know, and the ones on the right, they're still engaged in, in sort of making out, you know, and others, you know, rising and following these couples down the hill. Notice that woman sort of in the center there, sort of glancing back fondly on the, on the goddess's sacred groves and more happy couples down there at the bottom. Um, you know, it's, it's all so, 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 Nice, so gentle. I, 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 um, you can read this perhaps as a as a little melancholy. Um, you know, it seems that these people are all leaving the island or or getting ready to leave, and and 
many people have suggested that this is in part a comment on sort of the fleetingness of love, the transitory nature of love. Eventually, you have to leave, and, and you have to leave probably sooner than you might want to. Um, yes, it's all very lovely, but it's also transitory. W Watteau actually never said, he never, it was never, never he, he, he never explained, he wanted to leave it ambiguous. Um, so, uh, but you get the idea, right? You, 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 you see the sort of, the, 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 the spirit of it. Uh, here's uh, another one, right? La, la, uh, la Bodes. Um, the, the, you know, here um, you have this, this sort of uh, uh, aristocrat, gallant guy in his ridiculous but very fashionable clothes who is trying to chat up uh, this, this beautiful young woman and she's sort of flirting kind of a coquette Thing going on, but but also innocent, right? She's sort of deliberately indifferent, and he's sort of being, you know, he's attentive and rather insistent, um, uh, you know, and 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 you know, there's a certain sort of yes, whatever attitude to her, but she's not leaving either, you know. There's this whole uh, uh, flirtatiousness to this. Um, and it's, you know, I think you have to give Watteau credit. There's a certain gentle irony here. I think he knows exactly what's going on here. I think the two figures in the, in the, part, in the painting know exactly what's going on here. Um, I, 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 I think you could say that while he's not flattering these two, he's not mocking them either. Um, uh, their, their, their world is sort of fragile and elegant and sort of lyrical um, and maybe just a tiny bit, a tiny bit melancholy. Um, here's a more uh, overt uh, little bit of mockery. This is called faux pas, right? Here's the guy, the lover who has made his play, made the pass at, this, at his young companion and she's rejecting him as being rebuffed. Uh, and and you can feel how uh, how humiliated and how embarrassing this must be for him. A anyone who's ever had a uh, uh, an awkward romantic moment will perhaps recognize this. Um, uh, this one is called the pleasures of love, and again, you know, you just you know you you, you see it right. The, the, these beautiful aristocratic people. Uh, whiling their way, their time away in these beautiful outdoor gardens with all these symbols of love and, and fertility and 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 pairing off and and cuddling with each other and it's you know it's 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 all very very suggestive and all very very pleasant and um, uh, you know you you can you can look at this and you can recognize it's not going to last, right? This, this, this can't last. This moments, this, this sunset, this golden light, it, 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 it's not going to last. Um, uh, we know, in a way that Watteau could not, of course, that the French Revolution is going to blow all this away. Um, Watteau had something more emotional in mind. Another of the great French uh, Rococo painters is Francois Boucher, um, uh, who who lives uh, in the first part of the uh, of the 18th century. Um, very Rococo, right? He, he's known for these sort of idyllic, voluptuous paintings, uh, classical themes turned to the purposes of Rococo. Very decorative, pastoral, um, uh, and, and and he's also. Uh, 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 particularly known for his um, uh, his portraits of his his patroness Madame du Pompadour, and this is she. Uh, uh, she Madame du Pompadour was the uh, was a member of the French court and the official mistress of Louis the Fifteenth uh, from from seventeen forty five. Uh, until her death uh, in 1764. 
Um, it, it's interesting. She was actually trained by her mother to be a mistress. Uh, she was common born, and so she couldn't necessarily aspire to marry into nobility, but she could uh, nonetheless uh, benefit from them. Uh, she learned her trade very, very well. She was a very close companion uh, of, of King Louis the Fifteenth. She organized his schedule, uh, advised him, um, uh, and, and, and profited tremendously. She you know, secured titles of nobility. She became a marquesa herself. Um, and built this sort of network of people who who she she liked uh, and 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 was a major patron of of architecture and the arts. Um, she was a great a patron of the philosophes of the Enlightenment. Uh, Voltaire was was one of her entourage, um, and and um, uh, uh, you know, was was a was a significant player in the in the French. Court. This uh, this portrait uh, by by uh, by Boucher is again you know, it's so so beautifully Rococo, right? The 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 detail, the color, um, the intricacy of it, and she's so pretty. She's a, she's a, she was a beautiful woman, even even as she got older in age, she was uh, uh, renowned for her beauty, and she used art every bit as consciously. As Louis the Fourteenth or any other absolute monarch, she she liked to have the king surrounded by portraits of her looking beautiful to remind him of how beautiful she was um, and how fortunate he was. So um, uh, you know, you 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 have this this lovely picture of this lovely uh, clever woman. Um, a few more by Boucher, a few more Rococo. Um, this is um, Rococo does classical allegory, um, right? Uh, this is the story of Leda, who was, you know, legendarily beautiful, and Zeus turns into a swan to to seduce her. Um, of course, being Rococo, the point is all about is about. The, the, the romance and the suggestiveness and, and, and all of that uh, uh, rather than the sort of more macho classical allegory that you would have seen during the Baroque. Uh, here's another one, the uh, nude on the sofa, uh, that sort of Rubenesque figure. Uh, and, and again, this sort of lightness of color and, and light and texture, uh, it's, it's all just so very, very uh, uh, gentle. Um, the 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 other great French Rococo artist, maybe maybe the the most famous, is Fragonard, um, uh, who 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 lives um, throughout most of the most of the eighteenth century, and then and then even into an, past the revolution into the age of of Napoleon. Um, He's sort of a later Rococo uh, artist. He has tremendous uh, facility and talent, greatly exuberant, you know, in this sort of hedonistic joy of the senses and pleasure. Um, uh, um, he, was, he was prolific. He, he painted many, many, many works. Um, and, and, and sort of when you think of the ancien regime, when you think of the old order, uh, which precedes the French Revolution. This is what it looked like, or at least what they wanted it uh, to look like. He, he did over 550 paintings, um, and, and and this this you know this this this, this genre stuff cre is a is about uh, intimacy and sort of veiled eroticism. Uh, so so here is one uh, perhaps you've seen. Uh, this is called the young girl reading, and you can see again, right, the Rococo use of, of pastels, of gentle light, of shading, um, and uh, uh, you know you, you can ask yourself this question of um, what is she reading? Why is she reading it? Um, uh, is it is it a novel? Is it something frivolous? Um, more overtly frivolous is this 
the love letter. And yeah, you know, here's this this beautiful woman with her very fancy clothes and her ridiculous little dog uh, and this letter that has come for her you know, professing love and adoration um, leading at least metaphorically to the next scene right the stolen kiss where two young people uh, have arranged a meeting here uh, in the corner of a darkened hallway and the the brave young man uh, leans over and, and kisses her and um, you know, perhaps she's surprised and startled and it's inappropriate, but then again, it looks more like she's leaning into it than leaning away, doesn't it? Um, and and this, so this sense of, of um, romantic intrigue is, uh, is all about it. Here, um, probably the most, the most famous painting by Fragonard. Uh, and if you had Mr. Springer for World History, you've seen this before. This is known as The Swing, or, or The Happy Accident of The Swing. Um, it, it, it's, it's really one of the masterpieces of Rococo. Um, it, 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 there's a, there's, there are three figures here. Um, there's the young gentleman who is concealed in the, in the bushes, and uh, he's observing this lady being pushed by her spouse. So she's gone into the garden with her husband and she's gotten her husband to push her on the swing. But she knows that her lover, her boyfriend, is hiding in the bushes watching her. Um, and the husband, of course, is unaware of this. He's unaware of the, of the affair. As the lady swings forward, the young man gets a little glimpse of her dress, sees some of the legs, and oh, it's so scandalous and horrible. Um, uh, you know, the woman is so, is so swept up by this that her, her slipper is literally flying off her, her foot um, uh, with, with the, the titillating romance of it all. Um, and, you know, there's all the other Rococo things, right? The soft light, the pastel colors, the frivolous subject matter of the aristocracy entertaining itself, uh, the, the intrigue, all of it wrapped up in, in this painting. If, there, if you're going to have one Rococo painting, maybe, maybe this is it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah, for, uh, originally, actually, um, this, this was, um, uh, was commissioned by a, uh, a, a young nobleman uh, who wanted a, a portrait of his mistress on a swing, and uh, he asked a very uh, 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 sort of haughty art, French artist to do this, and the, uh, the, the, this fellow turned him down and says, well, go talk to Fragonard, he'll do it. Um, and so Fragonard produces this. Uh, okay, um, uh, one more French Rococo artist, Vigée Lebrun, uh, one of the first female artists that we're going to see rise to prominence. This is a self-portrait of, of her. Um, she, her work is mostly at the end of the, uh, of the 18th century. She is um, uh, uh, um, often... Um, uh, you know, in, in, in her in her style and her color, um, very 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 Rococo. She is, in in, in many ways, the um, almost the official portraitist of Marie Antoinette, the the Austrian princess who comes to marry Louis the Sixteenth and is the unfortunate queen of of France. Um, uh, during a period of six years. Uh, Lebrun paints 30 different portraits of Marie and her family um, and had a, had, a, had a close relationship uh, with her. Uh, again, there's this sense, you know, the, 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 even though it's Rococo, and it is Rococo, right? Again, color, light, frivolity, um, luxury. Um, you, you, Marie was, was not um, ignorant of the of the power of art, uh, just like other kings and people have used art to portray particular messages about them. Um, uh, Lebrun tries to help Marie make a better image of herself um, by painting portraits that include her children, made her more relatable to the public, um, and, and um, 
and, and, and was sort of tried to, tried to soften uh, uh, Mairi's public image. Um, here is a, a self-portrait by Lebrun uh, of herself at her easel. This was scandalous although you probably can't guess why. Um, she is shown smiling, open mouth. You can actually see some teeth in there. And that was absolutely not done. There was no precedent for it. Going the ancients, the Renaissance, you, you, you did not paint people open mouth. You did not show teeth. Uh, this was very daring and, and uh, uh, rather scandalous. Um, you may very well ask, what's what? Well, so what? But <laughs> that's the uh, um, uh, Lebron. Um, interestingly, uh, um, survives the French Revolution. The revolution comes. She and her uh, uh, her her family flee, um, having been closely identified with Marie Antoinette, who was hated, uh, having been closely associated with the French court. They were in danger during the revolution, so they, she travels all around. Uh, 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 around Europe, uh, paints many uh, nobles and aristocrats um, in other countries. Uh, eventually, she's able to return to uh, to France. She's pardoned under the uh, under the Napoleonic regime and uh, and and lives out a rather long um, and rather and, and prolific life. Okay, uh, finally, let's look at England. Um, the, you know, the Italians and the French uh, in the room would say, well, you know, England deserves to be treated last in a discussion of art anyway. Uh, I want to focus on one guy in particular, William Hogarth, um, who does his work in the first part of the 18th century. Um, uh, Hogarth is... is um, uh, Prolific. He does a great deal of different things, from very realistic portraiture um, to almost comic strip-like series of pictures on on moral subjects. Um, you know, the, the, this sort of political satire um, was was very much his thing, and he was very popular. Uh, I love this this self portrait of him because you know he puts himself with his dog. <laughs> you Nobody know, who loves his dog that much can be. All bad. Um, so um, a, a, a few pictures by Hogarth. You know, he's he's um, he's not Rococo in the in the French sense of the word, right? He's you're you're not going to see the the gentle, idyllic, luxurious pastels and the frivolous life of the nobility. That's not his thing. That's not the English thing. Um, but he's painting at this name in the same era. It's definitely not Baroque, um, and and the work's important. Um, so we'll sort of we'll we'll push it in here and call it some kind of vague English distant relative of of Rococo. Uh, the most famous work that um, that Hogarth did was uh, this Gin Lane. Um, gin had become a huge, huge problem in 18th century England. It was, it really was like the crack cocaine uh, of, of the cities uh, of England. Um, you know, gin is, is easy to, and cheap to make. Uh, it's very, very potent. It will absolutely get you drunk. Um, and, and it was blamed for all kinds of social decay and ruined neighborhoods. And so this, uh, this is, this is a, a scare painting. This is supposed to show you how horrible gin is and the awful effects of, of gin. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 this is a neighborhood that has been ruined by this, by this epidemic. You can see it's covered in a squalor, people who aren't working, people who are just completely uh, uh, drunk and have, have lost themselves. Uh, their only concern is how to find a little bit of money to get drunk again. Um, the, 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 the most shocking part, the focus of the picture is the woman in the foreground who is completely addled out of her mind with gin. She's been driven to prostitution. Um, those black marks on her leg are sores from syphilis. So she's got VD, and you'll see that she has a baby, but the, the, she's so drunk and out of it that she's 
literally dropping the baby out of her arms. It's going to fall down the stairwell to its death in this gin cellar um, below. Um, and she has n not even an awareness, much less a concern of, of what this. Now, that may, this may seem to be sort of an exaggeration um, uh, a, a, by, by Hogarth, who was, who was trying to persuade people to pass laws against gin. Um, but, you know, it's, it's actually not that much uh, of an exaggeration. Um, there were notorious and, and well-publicized stories of, of women who neglected their children, uh, who, who even murdered their children uh, because they were so uh, addicted uh, to, to, to gin. Uh, and that became a, a, a central theme of the, uh, of the anti-gin propaganda. Now, the companion piece to Gin Lane is this, Beer Street. And um, it, it, it was done at the same time. It was, it was meant to be seen side by side, Beer Street, Gin Lane, together. Um, and, and in comparison to the sort of sickly, hopeless, miserable creatures of Gin Lane, here on Beer Street, people are happy with, with good, robust health and good cheer. Everything is joyous and thriving. Industry and jollity go hand in hand here in Beer Street. Beer is understood as being an English thing, right? The traditional good English ale. This is... Uh, what happens when you drink when you drink beer? Um, the only person who's in trouble. You, you look over on the right. You see that one building which is sort of boarded up and 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 is in trouble. Uh, that's the pawnbroker, right? The the uh, Mr. Pinch lives there, but because everybody is doing so well on Beer Street, nobody needs to pawn their 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 goods. No one needs to pawn their stuff, and therefore the poor pawnbroker can't make a good living. Um, so 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 you know it, it's. It's clever, it's, it's intricate, uh, and, and you can spend a lot of time going through each of these figures and sort of finding their, uh, their, their opposite uh, in the two paintings. Um, okay, so, so one more series, one more sequence, and that's The Marriage a la Mode, uh, which is done uh, from 1743 to 1745. It's a series of six paintings uh, by Hogarth um, with, with a, a really skewering, just, a, just a, a vicious, funny, black mockery of upper class 18th century um, uh, English society. You know, in, 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 you can kind of compare this French Rococo you know, with, with our guys like Fragonard and Bouchard. Are, you know, it's, 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 it's all so beautiful and lovely and everything is great. Yeah, Hogarth's going to have none of that. In Hogarth, the upper class are vacuous twits who come to tragic ends. It's this very moralistic warning, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, encouraging uh, uh, like, uh, bourgeois values, in, in middle class family values, we might call them, um, uh, in comparison to the sort of decadence and emptiness of the aristocracy, so there are six. There are six paintings, and we'll go through them uh, in, in sequence because it really is a fabulous story. This is the first one, part one: the marriage settlement. And here, what we have is the arranged, negotiated marriage between two families. Uh, there's the alderman, um, who is the fellow in the uh, uh, long red coat, holding uh, in, sort of in the center of the picture, sitting at the table. Um, who is a, a commoner, but who has made a lot of money, and uh, his daughter is to the to the left. Um, she is going to be married to the son of Earl Squanderfield. The Earl is the figure at the far right with the uh, the fancy uh, uh, clothes, um, and his son is this vacuous-looking twit in the blue on the on the far left. So the alderman has money. The Earl is heavily in debt, but has a great ancient title. And so they're going to marry their children together so that the Earl gets money and the Alderman gets to have a noble grandson. Um, 
Notice that the two people who are actually going to be married to each other are completely indifferent. They're literally turning their backs on each other. Uh, notice Hogarth's symbolism down below. There are two dogs who have been chained together. Again, completely indifferent and ignoring one another. Um, the fellow in the corner leaning over and talking to the bride-to-be is the lawyer. Lo the evil lawyer silver tongue pay attention to him he's going to be an important figure um notice also there's uh there, there are other suggestions here uh hogarth's comp composition is very comp is very complicated um the mirror for example that the the young nobleman is looking into is cut up in half by the frame which is implying that the nobleman the young boy is only half a man um However, they, the, they get married, and this is uh, the second part, the tete-a-tete. -tete. Um, they, the, the, the couple are, are married now, um, but, they are, uh, but they are miserable. Um, it, the clock says it's 1.20. It's not clear whether it's 1.20 in the morning or in the afternoon, but either is bad. Um, if it's 1.20 in the morning, there, there has been a, a, a wild debauched party in the house, and the Viscount, the, the young nobleman, has been out all hours, uh, and the, neither of the, the couple are clearly not into each other. If it's 1.20 in the afternoon, then whatever happened the night before hasn't, it still hasn't been cleaned up. Uh, the candles were burning all night. It's a, it's a sign of, of uh, debauchery. Um, the husband is bored, disheveled, distracted, exhausted from what was probably a trip to the brothel. Um, his, his sword, you see there, is in the sheath but broken, which probably implies uh, that, that he is uh, impotent. Um, the wife has spent that home, has spent the evening at home playing cards. Um, but but in contrast, she looks rather content and pleased with herself. She takes a rather satisfied stretch. It's a very unladylike pose with her legs wide apart. Um, there's a rather large damp spot on the front of her skirt, implying something inappropriate. Um, and, and she's rather slyly looking at her husband and holding a mirror over her head. Um, uh, the message here is that she's she's having an affair. The husband is off uh, uh, out uh, chasing prostitutes, and she is uh, uh, engaged in something very illicit. Um, and, and the the house is is literally and, and figuratively a mess. Um, part three: the inspection, and here the viscount the is is going to a French doctor because. He has syphilis. Um, if you notice in the earlier pictures, there was a sort of a black patch on his neck mm -hmm. that was to cover the syphilitic sores. Um, he is now going seeking a cure. There, of course, there wasn't really any cure for syphilis at the time. Mm -hmm. The doctor yeah, is quite happy to uh, sell him uh, quack remedies and take his money, but uh, the Viscount is is going to be in a very bad way. And of course, if he has syphilis, he's probably also given syphilis to his wife. Part four, the toilet. Um, this is uh, a, 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 the, the old Earl has, uh, has died. And um, so the, 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 uh, the, the new Earl and his wife, the Countess, um, uh, are, are going forward in their home. This is the, at the very height of fashion. The Countess is hold, holding a toilette, a reception in her bedroom. Very French. Um, to invite people into your bedroom for this, this party. Uh, scandalous, of course, but um, uh, daring. Um, the, the, it, notice the, the, the husband... Is, is nowhere to be seen. There are all these people. Uh, the fellow in black on the sofa on the right, that's that lawyer silver tongue again. Notice how comfortable he looks. He's got his feet up, he's relaxed, uh, almost as if he's been here in the lady's bedchamber quite a number of times and is comfortable and at home. Um, 
There are other guests in the room, but the Countess has her back to them. She's totally absorbed by Silvertongue, the evil lawyer. Um, uh, he is, uh, you'll, 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 he, he's holding some tickets uh, to a masquerade uh, and, and uh, uh, pointing to a screen. He's ba what he's basically saying is, look, we can go out and because it'll be a masquerade, we can go out together and we don't have to hide the fact because we can, we'll be unidentifiable so we can safely attend together. Um, the Countess we're supposed to know, by the way, is a mother uh, hanging on the back of her chair is a... Uh, a, a, a coral a rope, which was used for teething, uh, but the children, the children are not in the picture, uh, sowing a sort of lack of maternal instinct from this this wicked, wicked woman. Um, now the drama picks up. Picture five, the Bajneo. This wa is is the the next stage. Um, the the, the Countess and Silvertongue went to the masquerade. You can see their costumes sort of discarded around the floor. Uh, they went to, this, uh, to, this, uh, to this, this sort of inn where they rented a temporary room and they were engaged in an adulterous affair when suddenly the Earl burst in uh, and confronted the, uh, his wife and Silvertongue uh, in the act. Silvertongue defended himself. You can see that his, there's a sword, a bloody sword there in the foreground on the floor. Uh, he stabbed the Earl several times and the Earl is now dying. Uh, Silvertongue, rather uh, in undignified fashion, is climbing bare-legged out the window trying to escape uh, because after all he's just murdered the Earl. The Earl is dying and the Countess is on her knees begging for forgiveness, begging uh, to, to, for her husband who she has betrayed to, uh, to, to forgive her. Um, it, 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 very dramatic and, and also quite, quite squalid. Um, uh, you'll see that the, 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 the city watch, the police are bursting in on the right as Silvertongue tries to escape on the left. And finally, the last scene, the lady's death. The Countess has returned to her father's house after her husband's murder. Uh, and the moral drama is concluded. Um, she is moved from dissipation and vice to misery and shame. And finally, she has committed suicide uh, after her lover, Silvertongue, is hanged at Tyburn uh, for murdering her husband. The, the, at her feet is the account of his death and his, his final speech on the gallows. She was overcome by this. Uh, and so she acquired poison and has drunk it and dies. Um, notice that very few people in the room actually seem to be all that upset about her death. Uh, the old maidservant and the, and the countess's daughter, they're actually sad. But the other people, eh, you know. Um, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, so the, the, the child is, is miserable and orphaned, uh, and, and notice, tragically, the child has a black patch on her neck, which means that she has contracted syphilis from her parents, uh, and the whole thing ends quite, quite miserably. Um, and so English, a Rococo, if, if such a phrase can be used, has a very different sensibility than, than French Rococo, uh, and perhaps it says a little bit about you, whether you, whether you prefer the English or the French.